we've talked a good deal about the past and we reflected on it on the first day for sure in that video uh, and in many of the conversations. Uh, and we've talked a good deal about the present. In fact, we have a session today, a long session today on the pandemic, uh, two hour session uh, uh, with quite a few speakers exploring different dimensions of the pandemic. But now we'd really like to look at the future uh, rather how do we get there? If we look for the last 12 years since the financial crisis suddenly was upon us, uh, things have been quite a roller coaster ride since then. Even when we thought we were going, gaining some momentum, we hit another hill. Uh, we had Obama, and then suddenly we found ourselves with Trump and uh, going in exactly the other direction. Uh, and it's natural that we uh, even the best of our futurists would be totally confused and baffled mm -hmm. about what's coming. Uh, we're not really here today to predict or prophesize what the future is going to be, but we are here to reflect on what we can do. Let's say capitalize on whatever the current situation is to generate some positive momentum to make it much better than it has been in the last few years. And we've seen enough in history to know that sometimes it's taken the greatest intensity of challenges to propel us in the right direction. Uh, right back from two world wars and a great depression, it took to give birth to the UN system uh, and the, UN uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It took 30 years of horrendous Cold War uh, to give birth to the internet, the World Wide Web, rather, which would never have existed, the EU, uh, a phenomenal accomplishment uh, in, in global history, uh, the World Trade Organization, and the positive, many positive developments in the 90s. And now the question is, uh, how can we mobilize both the opportunities and the challenges? Uh, Ketan Patel has been mentioning yesterday that uh, in the last, what, s well, 70 years, we've added 4 billion people to the population. We're also within about 10 years of almost total connectivity of the global population. We've seen that the pandemic brought not only unprecedented challenges, but it generated a momentum that really couldn't have been predicted even just a year or let's say 14, 15 months ago to do an about face and reversal or breakthrough on some issues that have been, uh, or some positions that have been resisting change for decades. I'm talking about the idea of shareholder profit, which finally even the WEF came back to say, well, we've made a slight miscalculation, the purpose of a business is not simply to benefit the shareholders, or uh, investment houses like, uh, uh, like BlackRock, uh, which finally said uh, that the SDGs matter and sustainability does matter, and we're going to uh, in invest seriously in it and withdraw from the opposite. And we had one a few, just a few days ago when General Motors announced that they're, they're uh, phasing out uh, petroleum-based uh, vehicles in the next five years uh, and trying to become a leader in an area field that they have been resisting ardently uh, as long as they could. Uh, we know that uh, though the MOOCs were born and really took off and gained momentum on everything they could to pretend they don't exist, uh, and to resist adapting. And yet in the last one year, we had a very interesting session on it last night. Uh, in the last one year, virtually every leading university in the world and many way down the line have, have gone and, and shown that they could convert and offer uh, quality education online, though certainly the transition had its challenges. So we know that whatever the difficulties may be, depending on how we respond to them, uh, there are possibilities to leverage the pressure. And then uh, very significantly, 
uh, what happened with uh, quantitative easing. Uh, uh, we saw that uh, in 2008, uh, just to save the financial system, uh, the, the Fed broke all the rules of, of public spending uh, in order to bail out uh, the society, not bail out the homeowners who had lost their homes, but bail out the, the banks. And now we bounce back with a, uh, serious efforts at a green deal or a green new deal, uh, and the idea real breaking the the old orthodoxy that we must not break these limits because eventually, sometime in the future, inflation is going to come and rear its head, uh, and we're entertaining uh, investment strategies that have simply been off the table since the Great Depression, really. So. There are opportunities been created. And the question we'd like, to, we'd like to explore today is how could we take this situation for better or worse and generate the maximum momentum to do what we know needs to be done? And of course, many of you are already engaged in efforts to do that. And that's very valid and we'd like to hear about them. But we'd like to think really big and think what could we do at the global level? What can the UN system do? What can WAS do? What can the civil society organizations do? What can academia do? Uh, uh, what can the nations of the world do uh, to really make the most of this, of this situation to make as much progress as we can on issues that we know uh, are not going to go away? And I think if we look back, maybe because even though I'm not living there, uh, uh, America is, is, is the center of uh, my perspective. Uh, uh, but just since November 8th, was it, or whatever it was, the election day, the amount of change has been quite extraordinary. U.S. is suddenly going back into Paris Accord. Uh, suddenly, we just when the arms control treaty was about to expire, uh, Biden and Putin come back and uh, renew it for another five years. Uh, we, we do see a wave. And the question is, how can we build that wave? And then, of course, on January what was it, 21st or 22nd, the first time nuclear weapons have been banned, officially banned in, by 50 countries in the world. These are things that we were not seeing for, for decades, let alone all in a scope of a couple of weeks or a couple of months. So the question is, what could we do to build it further? What could we build, do to build this momentum and take it further? And uh, I'd like to, we've got a, a wonderful, wonderful group here tonight or today uh, or this morning, uh, wherever we are. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, uh, most of you have been our, our been very active in the academy in the in the conference already, so I'll dispense with formal uh, introductions again. But uh, Bayara, can I ask you to start off and share with us your thoughts? Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Gary. Uh, first of all, congratulations to the WASP for for uh, this grandiose way uh, of celebrating a, a 60th uh, anniversary. Uh, it has been uh, part of the intellectual leadership in the world and I understand but when you talk about the momentum uh, that the world currently needs in order to move forward uh, that momentum has to start uh, with the leadership of ideas. The, the United Nations, uh, the 75 years of which we have also been recently celebrating uh, and uh, the various bodies uh, that are under its aegis have really managed the impossible in terms of putting forth the sustainable development goals and a variety of other clear and precise aims towards which the nations of the world should be moving. Uh, one of the things uh, that this uh, movement uh, lacks is an ability to enforce the good ideas that have been put forth, the excellent ideas that actually the General Assembly has 
at great difficulty and at great uh, trouble and effort managed to sign on to, uh, but there is lacking a mechanism whereby countries that do not uh, follow on the agreed bond plan uh, simply have uh, uh, gone their own way and all we can do is sort of uh, throw up our arms or, or uh, you know, pull our hair or, or sigh deeply, uh, but that's about the size of it. I'd like to speak about the question of quality of leadership and the quality of followers. First of all, leadership means nothing unless leaders, be they leaders of ideas, leaders of armies, uh, uh, leaders of countries or of regions, they do need committed followers, uh, followers that accept the goals and the aims, uh, not necessarily uh, without question, but bowing to the will of the majority. That has been a principle that has taken humanity an enormous length of time to accept, and that sadly, even today, is not accepted worldwide. Uh, so first of all, I think the uh, sort of variety of approaches to governance across the world today is, in my eyes, the major obstacle to making planet-wide progress more effective uh, and uh, uh, speedier than it is now. By the way, here again, I must say that the United Nations have achieved more than one might have expected from them under these circumstances. Uh, it, it has been close to a miracle to have a, agreed uh, to various aspects, both the Paris Accord uh, and, and the SDGs are, are truly remarkable um, accomplishments. But we saw what happened when somebody does not like some aspect of some international agreement, like Mr. Trump, uh, he simply steps off the boat uh, and uh, walks off in a different direction. And that means that uh, 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 the most power, so far the most powerful country in the, in the world for four years uh, was sort of not part uh, of that army of change that we'd like to envision moving forward. In other places like China, we have very strong leadership uh, and we have a system of governments whereby citizens, uh, to be polite about it, are not encouraged uh, to manifest uh, disagreement uh, with uh, the uh, decisions of the leadership uh, and the directions they have chosen. Quite the contrary, uh, dissidence uh, is, uh, is not tolerated and, and can have rather severe uh, penalties. Uh, we see in cases where leaders and followers sort of get out of step, as was the case in Belarus, as is now case in Myanmar, uh, with the Navalny case in Russia, with uh, uh, America, a variety of, uh, of events in the United States, uh, of the nation, the people, uh, if you like, going into the streets, a substantial portion of the population being ready to go out in the streets and to take power to themselves. But if we look and analyze what were the uh, stimuli, the, the sort of the sparks that set the tinder flame uh, for manifestations, for popular manifestations, we realize that sometimes they are informative, uh, an informative use of modern technology. And we all, those who believe in democracy, could say this is something where the people are asking for their rights, because what we want in the world is a future where individual in persons uh, are considered of equal value and individuals have rights, not just obligations. Uh, and of course, we also want to live on a planet uh, that can survive the onslaught that the human species, uh, by its, its rapid multiplication, uh, is, is placing as a charge uh, on this planet. 
In either case, what we find are entirely different nar narratives that drive people out in the street. And sometimes there are those that from our pure point of view, I think uh, we share a lot of us uh, similar views. We would consider that legitimate uh, requests for honest uh, elections where every vote counts and every citizen uh, can consider that they have participated in a global decision-making process. Uh, when this has been grossly, uh, grossly uh, ignored uh, by those currently holding power, or by those who uh, were in the background as in Myanmar, frankly, holding the power, if you like, with a lighter hand and now, now doing it with a heavier hand. In those cases, we, we sympathize with these people. But when on the, on the 6th of January, uh, a mob, uh, an undisciplined mob, uh, attacked uh, a visible symbol of democratic governance in the United States, we did not approve. But when we look at the reasons and the uh, sparks that set it off, they were information that was available to these people. And what we find is that when we think about paradigm change and paradigm change in the direction of making humanity safer and making the planet more habitable for a longer time, we have completely different ideas, even about the pandemic. There are people who deny it even exists. There are people who deny that there have been uh, so many deaths and so forth. So the question of leadership and followership, the ability of followers to find confidence and trust in those who lead them is becoming a crucial aspect. And the ability to be tell truth from fiction is going to become increasingly acute in the future. And this is where scientists have something to say but I think psychologists should be working hard to see what it is that convinces people and what it, why is it so easy to convince them sometimes of clearly illogical conclusions. Question mark. As usual, you end with a provocative comment. Thank you, Madam President. It's always a pleasure to, to listen to you so thoughtfully and perceptively. And you mentioned something uh, you touched on an issue which I did not mention, and I think it was, it's very important that I should have, and that is that one of the things we see now is a level of social activity and activism uh, that we have not seen for decades. Uh, it, expressed, it, it, it expressed with Occupy Wall Street and, and then and faded, kind of faded out for a while, and now it's come back with Fridays for the Future and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and what's going on everywhere. And the, I think the point you have made, or one of the points you've made is that how do we direct that energy? The energy has been released. The sense of this dissatisfaction with what exists is now being vocally expressed. And how do we direct that energy positively uh, is really the critical challenge. Exactly. That's Exactly. Either it's going to generate more conflict or it's going to generate a positive momentum for, for, for social growth. Uh, uh, right. for, for, and that's a, a really good way of, of positioning the, uh, the question before us. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when I met Harlan Cleveland when he was in, back in 92, when he was president of the World Academy, I started talking to him about a phenomenon that I thought was very important, and it's the what we call the revolution of rising expectations. Uh, and uh, he smiled to me and he said, do you know where that comes from, that phrase? I said, no, I don't really know at all. And uh, I took down the, uh, the Bartlett's familiar quotations, and uh, this, this phrase was attributed to Harlan when he was working for the US State Department uh, in East Asia around 1950, when he saw Japan uh, and Korea, suddenly uh, Hong Kong and the East Asian, what became the Tigers, suddenly seeing, becoming aware of how far behind they were the rest of the world and, have, and releasing a tremendous energy to catch up. 
And about six months later, I was passing through Delhi and I met a very distinguished security expert from the Indian uh, government, who later became a fellow of the academy and a very dear friend. Uh, and when, he, when I mentioned this phrase to him, the revolution of rising expectations, he said, yes, it's a very, very powerful force. But you know, it has another side to it. Because when the gap between the expectations and the reality becomes, the, the greater it is, the more energy it releases. But when the gap gets too great, that it leads to a perception that the real, that what we really want is just out of reach, then you end up getting frustration. And then you get the energies, instead of driving development, you get it sp spreading off in frustration, anger, resentment, and blaming somebody or other. So the question of how we manage these energies is really, uh, uh, is, is really a, a core issue. Now I'd like to ask uh, uh, Chantaline, please share some thoughts with us, how you think we can channel these energies. This is your job, right? Yeah, well, part, yeah, part of my job. Yes, exactly. And thank you so much, Vaira. Um, very great setting the stage. I'd like to build on um, what you've said. And uh, yeah, I, I am, you know, when people ask me, would we be able now to achieve the agreement we had in 2015 on Paris Agreement, on the SDGs, and don't forget, on financing for development as well. We had a tremendous year, and we also had the um, Sendai framework for uh, disaster reduction, which now is coming back and showing its importance. All of these four agreements were agreed by all of our nation in, 19, in, in, 19, in, 2000, in 2015. And it would not, if, if, you, if you look at it objectively, it, it would be maybe now with the new management, but even then, I don't think we could get this agreement. So the universe kind of, allowed us in 2015 to have the right constellation of stars to actually get these goals. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so uh, optimist about them. Now, in terms of, UNTED has done a lot of work in terms of the financial crisis versus this crisis, economic crisis, it turns out to be now. Um, and there's major differences. And guess what? You know, one of my interns this summer I asked them to look at our green and gender responsive, the stimulus packages are now compared to the financial crisis. Because now we have the SDGs, we didn't have the SDGs. And so despite the fact that we have these super ambitious, never before goals, the stimulus packages, and, in, and if I have to give the caveat that most countries are still in support mode as opposed to uh, relaunching the economy mode, right? But still, the stimulus packages are less green than they were during the financial crisis so far, and they are less gender responsive. I mean, none of them were gender responsive. So it seems like we, we, we managed to get the goal, and it gets back to what you were saying, Vaira, but it doesn't sink into the decision-making process. It doesn't change our pattern of thinking and then implementing the, the policies that need to be put out. So the question then becomes how do we make that happen, right? And um, Gary and Nila and others were kind enough to invite me on the panel on Monday where there was a young man, can't remember his name, um, on the panel and he mentioned the youth and a partnership with the youth. And if we, you talk about this and energy that has been unleashed and a lot of that energy comes from our youth and they see it. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because they are our best ally because the, the, we have already $13 trillion have been printed and helicoptered in on our economy. This is creating two things. One, it's basically that money is gonna do one of two things. Either settle us for the next 50 years in the, the, the economic system that we have, which is brown and deliver for the few at the expense of the majority and the planet, or it's gonna trans help trans accelerate the transition towards the SDGs and where we really wanna be. And for that, Who's the better place people than our youth to help us do this transition and advocate and ensure that we get there? And these trillions do not go in the old, but go in the new economy that deliver for all and not at the expense of the planet. And we need a major advocacy right now because these trillions are still being allocated. I'm not talking about the, those that are there to support the workers and the job because these need to be there. But even some of these could be don't use to uh, allow this just transition towards renewable energy as opposed to fossil fuel energy. 
and towards sustainable agriculture instead of you know the intensive agriculture chemical intensive agriculture we've been practicing it could be helping towards this a real education system that of the 21st century that actually train our students to be prepared for the job market of the 21st century it could actually be used to ensure that the health system is universal and nobody has to worry that they actually can lose their job and lose the insurance at the same time or then the gig economy have no social protection whatsoever so I think it's extremely important. We have once in a generation opportunity, and then Amina Mohamed, our DHG, mentioned it several times, and I, I totally concur with her. I'm a, tra I'm a trained agricultural and trade economist. I did not see in all my career an opportunity to change the trade regime. We have an opportunity now, right now, to change the trade regime. We have a woman that says that she emphasized the economic empowerment of women on, in trade agreements. We are just talking about the reform of these trade agreements. We're talking about the reform of the investment agreement related to the industrial policies, related to the digital policies. We're going to be reviewing those in the next five years. These need, need to be done. Either we're going to be we're going to have stranded asset and stuck with the whole economy for the decades to come, or we're going to be accelerating and have a new economic and financial system that actually going to help us get there. And so. I'm not exactly sure, Gary, except for the fact that we need the youth with us <laughs> to ensure that, the, and we provide the scientific evidence, the, the what type of new economics for sustainable development get us there, what type of policy, but not just the type of policy for the just transition. And I think I've said that in a previous speak, talk, but we kind of know which policy work. We economists have worked on the, if we could cost effective and efficient policy, right? The problem is how do we ensure that a, a government that gets elected every four years, and as you said, Vaira needs their population behind them, actually can put in place these policies. When there's gonna be some time costs in the short term, and then the benefit will be more in the, in the medium and longer term. And this is what we need to focus on, is how do you transition? What are the policy and the measure and the mechanism for the transition to these carbon neutral, SDG compliant, um, markets. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chantaline, and uh, thank you for particularly reminding us of one of the greatest positives we have is we have an awakened youth, I think, at a level we haven't seen since the 60s. Uh, and, uh, and that's a force to reckon with if we can mobilize it in the right direction. Uh, I'm glad, Mila, you have joined us. I'm going to ask you to join me with the in the moderation. Because Stefan, uh, energize us now and convince us that the the challenges of the moment can really be converted into a positive momentum. Because you've got a, a a genie in your pocket. No, I'm not so sure, Gary. First of all, thanks for having me and joining this uh, session. When I first read this topic, I got a little bit scared because I feel a little bit agnostic, uh, if not to say ignorant, to answer that question about leadership for planetary momentum. And so I, I was sitting down and said, well, let me think about discussion memories from Ivo, from Gary Yu, from Winston, and from Alberto I had over the last 10 years trying to answer this question. And I'm just mentioning some bullet points and then leave it with that for the debate. Should we, should we discuss, when we're talking about leadership, about the new systems clash, the new systems clash between open societies and human-centered societies on one side and digital autocracies on the other? Should we discuss digitization as the third culture who can be a big integrator for all of us? Should we discuss this entire topic of leadership for planetary momentum on a philosophical level of something beyond necessity and chance, looking for the right opportunities? Should we discuss it that Chantal mentioned it, looking at the right financial system in place required in order to shift from the fossil into a, into a green economy? Or should we talk about a narrative? 
Meaning, you know, I think the selection advantage of humans is not the opposition of the thump, not talking, not thinking, not emotions, not the cap capacity to collaborate. Ants and apps can do that too. Our selection advantage is that we have the capacity to tell each other stories about something that actually doesn't even exist. Fictitious stories about God and about money, to take two of them, we all believe in. And suddenly we start coordinating large cohorts of millions and billions of people towards the right future. You know, I'm, I'm a financial expert on one side and I'm a medical doctor running a hospital ground zero in the COVID mess at the moment at the same time. I have the feeling for me personally, when we're talking about leadership for planetary momentum, I would prefer talking about the narrative on one side and on the financial schema on the other, which is one of the WAS initiatives we've been uh, running since five years, the Tower of Finance. And I think we have a comprehensive financial narrative to particularly and specifically describing and allowing this shift Chantal mentioned from the old to the new economy, from a brown economy to a green economy. And um, I will leave it with these notes and I'm looking forward for a fruitful debate. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I thought you were going to save us with the Dow of Finance, and uh, uh, because you've got the answer in your pocket. Yeah, we, we do have. You know, the point is when we talk about finance, these formats of three to five minutes makes it extremely complicated and partly even destructive. Yet, yesterday I spoke with parliamentarians in Berlin about it, and they gave me forty-five minutes, and then it's. And I feel a little bit kind of scared to say, I think we have one of the components with the Tower of Finance at hand, we have one of the components in hand in order to create a financial environment where we can allow the shift from one age to the other, from a fossil age to a post-fossil age. We have the financial engineering, we have the securizations, we have the monetary and fiscal policy at hand. And I'm happy to discuss that more in details with you or in a separate forum. But I feel a little bit um, hesitant to speak two or three minutes quickly on the Tower of Finance. But please, if some of you are interested in having more, wanting to have more information about it, please do not hesitate to contact me and I can provide you with tables and figures and one pagers and two pagers and UN talks and whatever is pr it's necessary. But I'm getting more and more convinced over the last months. I've been mentioning this uh, yes on, on on Monday in our introductory session that we got approved over and over again that we are with our approach, Gary, on the right track. We have the two. We we really we have the tools in hand. And, and say it, Stefan, and go. Then say it, please. Oh, uh, in two or three minutes. In two or three minutes, we need for the, for the, we need for the SDGs as a as a rough roadmap for the future. Roughly four to five trillion U.S. dollar on, on additional liquidity. We can partly do that with private money, with the private capital market. But about two thirds of the SDGs are global commons. They don't are not eligible to be privatized. Otherwise, we're ending in a completely different world. Nobody really wants here in this panel. So if we want to go to finance our commons, we have to think about introducing a parallel currency system, either driven by digital tokens or by central bank digital currencies, parallelization and digitalization of these currency systems with the distributive ledger technology, basically blockchain technology, fourth generation, that basically abolishes illicit transactions, corruption, fraud, shadow economy, and targets investments, and targets consumptions, and targets the entire SDGs towards where we want them to, uh, where we want you to go. 
And this can be done, by the way, this can be done with less than 200 staff in less than 18 months. I've been in contact with the corporate world. I've been in contact with regulators and um, the feedback I'm getting when I speak with people from BITS, IMF and World Bank is, yes, you're right. Yes, you're right, but we are the wrong address. You have to go to the ministry and the Department of Finance to get that approval. So we are in between the chairs, between the regulators and the financial officers and the, the White House, basically. So the executive offices to make that happen. So if I understand you correctly, we have a solution in hand. The world has a solution in hand and a lot of the central banks know it already. Uh, and what we need is to convert this pressure of this circumstance into a positive momentum that will push us over the brim the way it pushed GM to suddenly renounce a <laughs> hundred years of, uh, literally a hundred years of uh, their investment in the uh, petroleum-based transport industry. Uh, yeah. and, and the same with business and BlackRock and everybody else. So that's the topic for us. If we can't finish it in an hour or an hour and a half, we don't mind taking a week and listening to you. <laughs> and working out that strategy, there is an, if there's an answer, even for a critical part of it, mm -hmm. we need to come with that. And at least for the, I'm talking to the academy, we can't stop until we've explored every possibility. At least you put it on the table now, which is all I was asking. So thank you for, thank you for that. Phoebe, you're actively working and I can't even put my mind around all of the initiatives that you're involved with all of them trying to have an impact, all of them trying to uh, break through the resistances and, and take the ideas, these fabulous goals and make them a reality. What do you think we can do to generate greater momentum, to push through? Whether it's what you can do or the EU can do or the Academy can do or civil society can do or the world can do, what are, not just wishful thinking, but what can we do that we're not doing yet, please? Thank you, Ngari. Thank you um, for uh, inviting me in these uh, exciting talks and uh, the very interesting contributions from all the speakers. I am an optimist and I believe in the human race. And uh, what I believe is that there is the will to move forward, uh, but we lack capacity. We don't know how. And because the how is important, I think it makes sense to refer to two reports that I am involved in and um, that showcase the transformations for the sustainability transition at this point in time that we consider it to be once in a century opportunity to put wealth growth in the right pathway, in a sustainable pathway for the prosperity of people and nature. The first report is the Lancet COVID-19 um, uh, Commission uh, report. Uh, a few days ago, we've launched the second uh, statement of this um, commission. The commission is led by Jeff Sachs and has a number of commissioners. I, I am one of them, and I am the co-chair of the Green Recovery Task Force. This commission, calls for three urgent actions in the COVID-19 response. The first one is that all regions with high rates of new COVID-19 cases, including the US and the EU, should intensify measures to minimize community transmission alongside rapid deployment of COVID-19 vaccines. The second um, recommendation is that governments should urgently and fully fund WHO and the access to COVID-19 tools accelerator, inclu including the COVAX. Since April 2020, the 
uh, accelerator partnership launched by WHO and partners has supported the fastest, most coordinated and successful global effort in key history to develop tools to fight a disease. The third recommendation is that G20 countries should empower the International Monetary Fund and multilateral development banks to increase the scale of financing and debt relief. With uh, regards to this, we say in particular that the IMF and multilateral development banks, the World Bank and regional development banks uh, were created for such emergencies. And uh, we welcome the possibility of a new allocation of special drawing rights, the reserves ca currency of the IMF. So the IMF should supplement the international reserves of IMF member states and a new allocation of special drawing rights could be particularly important, will be particularly important from countries that face balance of payment shortfalls in the context of COVID-19 and could be mobilized in innovative ways to increase the financial capacity of COVAX. The, um, Three priorities, containment of transmission, rapid vaccination and emergency finance will require improved global cooperation. So now more than ever, the multilateral system must be supported to work efficiently to deliver know-how and COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics and other vital supplies to all nations. And to do that, we need multilateral cooperation and technical training and active sharing of best practices and full deployment of international policy tools. This is uh, the, the, the general recommendations from this um, Global uh, Commission for COVID-19. And with regards to green recovery, we state that this is a turning point for sustainable, inclusive and resilient, resilient development. And um, we understand that countries are facing the trade-off of whether they should provide the stimulus spending in order to provide immediate support to maintain business as usual versus transformative spending, focus on accelerating the transition to a job space, green and digital economy and inclusive society. But we uh, argue that it's important to go green and sustainable and inclusive because of three main reasons. First of all, we know by recent simulations of the effect of green recovery worldwide that green economic stimulus is more growth enhancing than return to normals, uh, return to normal stimulus, because return to normal stimulus will merely boost the unsustainable current consumption for um, production partners. We also uh, say that uh, we need to recover green to avoid significant risk of extreme weather events and poverty for hundreds of millions of people to the impact of climate change, as we all know. And thirdly, we need to recover green to reduce the likelihood of future pandemics. It is important to understand and integrate the connection between environmental and public health again, agendas in policy making, cleaning up unsustainable supply chain and production processes that lead to deforestation and biodiversity threats can help reduce the risk of future zoonotic diseases and pandemics. Maybe we think- I'll ask you a question, sorry, because we're gonna- Yes, yes, please. You've got a wonderful program and you've got really sensible, solid answers. Let me just ask you in the last minute, uh, what more can we do to sell well, this? Form? That's, I, I'm totally okay. confused with what you're saying, but how can we, what more can we do to build on that? 
or, or to well, well, uh, as i said before gary and uh, this is what uh we detail in the uh, uh the first uh united nations sustainable development solution solution network european uh report is uh, the pathways, the transformation pathways, we need to showcase which technologies, which financial tools, and with which uh, budget we are going to uh, implement this transformation. It is not enough to say the SDGs. It is not enough to say the nine U European Green Deal policies. We need to connect the two. And in this report, we show that the two are mirror image and then construct for the policymakers, the politicians, the financial institutions, the uh, NGOs, uh, the businesses, the pathways. People need help in constructing the pathways because this is a science-hungry, data-hungry business. And, it, and there is no capacity in the world to do that. Let me give you an example to, to showcase how we can help. Since sorry. the 1980s... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. We're not going to. We're already running behind, so we're not going to have time for the example. Though I would love to hear it. I'm sure we all. Okay. Uh, but we'll. We won't miss you. We'll come back, and uh, if not in this discussion, we won't. We won't leave until we've heard the rest of this. If not in this morning, this session, in, in sometime else, because this is. We really want to understand what we can do, to to be a lever to multiply the efforts. And I know I, it's not a fair question to ask you uh, uh, in the limited time available. So, I, But I'd like to be sure that we finish with the other speakers. Milo, yes, we... my main point is that we need to build capacity fast and efficiently. There are, the expertise are there. We need to streamline them where they can be of greater use. The expertise, we have the expertise, but they are not diffused in the right channels and the institutions and the nations do not have explicit pathways to follow. So the, the, the resources are there, the capacity, the, ultimately the potential is there. We're not mobilizing the, the resources and all with the necessary knowledge and will to to make it happen. And so you're, that's an answer. And we'd like to, we, the Academy, would like to really work with you and discuss further what can be done to accelerate this process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mila? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what, what I'm noticing here is something that uh, Stefan poignantly pointed out, that we are trying to respond uh, to something that uh, we are not prepared for we didn't anticipate necessarily or partially anticipated uh, or uh, half anticipated. And we are trying to do something that doesn't really exist or become something that we, is unknown to us. A uh, part of that story that I hear from these exquisite panelists and contributors is that we're zooming out on the global context. But the coming three speakers could share with us something very contextualized, especially all three speakers are coming from the Balkans. Um, and from a very uh, dramatic history of separations and trying to reunite the knowledge and the social forces to see how we can go forward. And that's another situation that is being replicated now or exacerbated now through the pandemic, that we see nation states kind of scurrying and scrambling to take care of uh, their domains in the, in the face of the health crises. But at the same time, we need global collaboration. This is a really misaligned or crooked approach and the struggle that we're facing. And all I'm asking for is not that we necessarily have the answers at this point, um, as Stefan pointed out, but that we have at least those um, experiences from the context to share those perspectives and what it is that we can learn in what is apparently a new process of social learning that is happening in this panel and is happening globally 
and it's happening nationally and also amongst disciplines and, and professional associations, just like Phoebe pointed out, this is what we can offer, but how do we build the capacities and pathways to scale up and scale out? So I'm gonna call on His Excellency Ivo, who is the former president of Croatia. If you can speak to us what it is that we have learned through the strife and struggle uh, and the, uh, the, the, the strenuous attempts to reintegrate and reintegrate better, I would say, um, and also speak to the topic, what kind of leadership would take to reintegrate us? If anybody knows that, I think we from this region know the painstaking effort for cultural shift. Ivo, please. Uh, so thank you for the invitation to participate on this uh, conference. Um, firstly, I would like to congratulate the World Academy for 60 years of very successful uh, business they are doing in science, social sciences, in politics, and hope we are going to continue in next several hundred years. Uh, firstly, I would like to stress that we always quote uh, this uh, wording, historia est magistra vitae. Unfortunately, history teaches only one important thing, that we don't learn from history. Humanity is repeating and repeating wars, unfair treatment, uh, mistakes in communication, personal mistakes, and so on and so on. So, uh, I don't Thing that uh, experience from the wars, from pandemics, from uh, all other dramatic, uh, the dramatic uh, moments from our history uh, will be used positively, definitely positively, yes. So uh, I think that uh, leadership is very important to really accept knowledge from the history because uh, many leaders, former leaders, uh, very easily forget what happened and what should we not repeat? The Balkans wars are probably the best example. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, I heard many optimistic scenarios about the future after COVID and during the COVID, what can we do? What are possibilities, new possibilities? What are challenges and uh, uh, optimism about how to respond to challenges? But uh, I'm not very sure that it really happened, uh, especially because uh, we are witnessing very uh, dramatic changement in our societies, in global societies, and in particular society states all around the world. Uh, can you imagine that Trump, after all he did in the mandate, had 70 million of voters, 70 million. Can you imagine that he had so many people in Europe, in European Union, who admired him? Some European leaders supporting him even today. Uh, how can you explain that in this modern society, we have contemporary society, uh, having all new technologies, new knowledges, uh, uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, books, uh, uh, humanities are pieces of art, we have more and more people hating, hating on internet, nationalistic, religious hate is a big portion of our uh, internet network. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I think that a different type of leadership is needed more than ever. I ask myself whether we are going back to some kind of new middle ages, new middle ages, because you can easily find even today so many people uh, being uh, against vaccination or thinking the earth is flat or whatever. So uh, I think human society, human race is now imperiled, not only by uh, uh, climate change, wars or whatever, but it's imperiled by a new, very conservative state of mind. Conservative and wrong, that's very important. So uh, the leadership, modern leadership should uh, be very efficient against the tendency to remove human race from prospect, from prosperity, from 
uh, new technologies, from new knowledges, from modern democratic societies to new middle ages. So uh, uh, what I consider as the most important thing for modern leaders is to have a very clear agenda about values. What are the, the most important values today? And especially politicians should uh, be in accordance, in accordance with those values. Firstly, of course, like always, I stress that leaders, political leaders especially, should fight for the peace. Peace is the most important value uh, for human race. Then, of course, we have human rights, more than human rights. Unfortunately, not human majority today enjoy human rights as we understand uh, human rights in Europe. Uh, the situation all around the globe is even dramatic in many, many countries. Then, of course, we have to be aware, uh, or leaders should be aware, about uh, solidarity, especially in connection of this pandemic now, with uh, in in, uh, in, um, con uh, in having in mind uh, COVID in, uh, pand pandemic. Uh, then, of course. Uh, we are facing in many parts of, of uh, countries with in many parts of the world with uh, extremism, with nationalism and uh, unilateralism, selfishness, selfishness of politicians themselves and selfishness of some states and societies, not capable to uh, lead politics politics in frames of multilateralism. So multilateralism is also one of values that should be expected from uh, modern leadership. And uh, there are many other values, but I would like to stress care about the young generation, especially in this very moment. Uh, young generation is imperiled uh, because uh, educational systems are now uh, very weak because of pandemic, because of new techniques uh, of education. I have opportunity to witness myself because I have lectures and exams uh, via uh, internet. It's uh, quite different. The knowledge is uh, lower than before. Uh, there are no communication. Social skills are different and diminished. And definitely economy is changed and uh, sooner or later, we are going to recognize that many working places are going to be lost. Not Thank only you. because of, of, of economical power, but because of changement in structure. That means, uh, means that many uh, young people, relative young people who were educated for one type of economy, tomorrow will be uh, in position to understand that their skills are not worth anymore. So uh, you, I will finish my uh, finish my speech with uh, with um, uh, thesis that uh, today it's very important and very dangerous checkpoint for humanity, and this checkpoint needs uh, leadership based on positive. Uh, human values. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you bring about a very important uh, question of the values, and I think that's what builds on what Stefan was discussing. Uh, he is speaking about a narrative. We need a narrative, right? But we also need precise st uh, strategies for systems change. If we had indeed a narrative that we can all connect to and agree on, a new paradigm of values, then his three to four minute explanation would be possible, right? but only then he would get a full hour for a systems change strategy. This is the problem that we're seeing and you're pointing that out. We don't have a common framework that is globally accepted, a new set of values that we can all connect to. And you rightfully so point out the education of the youth. I would add re-educating and unlearning of the adults in the new system of values. That's what's necessary, right? And you point out the 71 or 72, I mean, these numbers could be rising of the voters for Trump and we are taken aghast and taken aback, like kind of taken by surprise, which shouldn't be. If we, uh, if we're practicing a science of society and better study of social forces, that's what we need to know in order to understand what kind of new paradigm and that is cultural change we need in order to mobilize everybody. 
solid uh, leadership of solidarity and inclusivity is going to have to incorporate 72 million of voters for Trump and also all other social forces that have risen. They have their own logic while they risen in response to what? And that is the question. That is the setting up of the stage and the question I have for Zlatko, but I'm going to just, I've served this so that, that I can hear kind of Zlatko's response. The reason I'm calling on him is because he comes from a, from a wonderful um, organization, Nizami Ganjavi International Center that uh, His Excellency Vaira is, is uh, co-chairing, um, that is actually focused on convening that experience of politicians, policy makers, policy makers uh, uh, to, to come together at a higher level for the renewed redefined multilateralism to say, what have we learned? What, what is our oversight? What, what were our blind spots? How can we truly integrate all the leadership at that level going forward? Zlatko, I'm staging your, your comment because I would really like a response to this. So you have some time to be generous. I would like to call on Faris, whose uh, specialty is actually medical field. Faris, if you want to address the current um, meta context of health crisis, or uh, I know um, um, Evo has staged things for you as well on the question of education and if we can be succinct and, and strategically um, kind of focused, that would be great. So Faris, please. Uh, respected uh, chairman uh, and uh, co-chairman, dear Gary and uh, Mila, uh, I would like to greet you and greet the dear all here presenting at this session. And uh, I would like to, to say that I'm very honored to be present at, uh, and participant in this session. I wrote a uh, small paper uh, and I titled it, The Manager as a Leader in a New World Paradigm. But from the very beginning, just to congratulate, congregate the congregation for the 16th anniversary of the World Academy of Art and Science. And as I said, it's a very privilege to be here. After the outbreak of coronavirus disease, social contacts were drastically reduced and uh, an obligation was imposed for a completely new way of life and interpersonal uh, for interpersonal interaction. Managers are forced to completely change the concept of organization and management of business structures in order to prevent the spread of the infection through virtual platforms. This kind of sudden changes in business and life resulted with the multiple problems and the challenges. Inna Leroy, the executive director of human capital practice in Deloitte Consulting, in uh, October 2020, during the uh, BBC Work Life, said more than half of the global workforce is working remotely, and they are fundamentally continues to threat uh, health. Uh, we are looking at the long period of hybrid working from uh, office or home in different proportions. In virtual world, we have high level of information that are not systemized. So the, the leaders have a bit test to prevent this kind of unorganization and provide correct way of information and selection. Even though we have optimized uh, algorithms that help us find and connect different subjects that we are searching for, we have to have self-awareness and knowledge that can save our time and direct us to learn and inform ourselves. The positive effects are certainly the possibility of faster action and finalization of assignments from the uh, comfort of our love, thus creating same atmosphere for ourselves and our loved ones, reduce moment resulting in better fight against this new vicious virus. Digital transformation in every segment of life and uh, business is inevitable and unavoidable change. Despite this fact, it's a very negative effect on a person's psychophysical health, isolation and abuse, physical contacts between individuals made people feel lonely and depressed. Abolishing freedom of moment, even for the benefit of the community, did not prove to be the best solution. According to the definition of the World Health Organization, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being rather than merely the absence of disease or illness. Therefore, after such a historical reversal, we can ask ourselves what consequences the appearance of new virus 
will leave on humanity. We have a big tasks in front of us. We have to start by changing our own working environment that we have control over and fit to modern flows. In given circumstances, operative management diminishes according to the potential of virtual space. And strategic management become more important and coming closer to leadership. The leaders and strategic managers have two main questions to ask. What is ahead of us? The first one, and what is going uh, on uh, when the pandemic stopped as the first question? And the second one, what we have to do if nothing changes? Thank you, Faris. What I want to recognize here quickly is the, the, the question of management, which I think uh, the leadership cannot be equated to management anymore. We are going to be in serious trouble if we're not able to conceive of a different kind of leadership. That's one question, which is going to go to Zlatko as well, and another, of course, of that social contact. And the uh, virus is this uh, terrible, vicious virus. I mean, what can we learn from the intelligence of virus and the way it spreads? What kind of cultural coding do we need to match spreading solidarity, empathy, and mobilize the leadership learning from the situation? Zlatko, please. I think that uh, it is very important that uh, if we want to go forward, if we really want to do uh, tackle something which is called leadership for planetary momentum, we have to have big, hairy goal. We have to have big thing. We have to think big. And the pandemic behind us and history that we learned, there's giving us a lot of big reasons to think differently. Uh, I mean, I don't want to make comparison with Black Plague that were, gave birth to Renaissance and then later in time, and Enlightenment. I don't want to talk about World War II the 75 years ago give additional push to create a completely new multilateral system where we are still witnessing today. So obviously this pandemic is uh, uh, giving us a lot of reasons to think big. Uh, we had, as Phoebe was mentioning very, uh, I mean, clearly about sustainable development goals. We already, even without pandemic, we had a big hairy goal that we should go for. And SDGs and Agenda 2030 for itself it's very, very big reason to go through. Now, since we are now uh, talking about 60th anniversary, I want to congratulate Gary to you and all, all founding fathers of, of uh, WAS. But uh, at the same time, I just want to remind you that 60 years ago, President Kennedy put the United States on a mission to the future. And I'll quote, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decides is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of the space and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. So our generation moonshot is right now in front of us and this is not going to Mars or living on the moon. It's basically speaking of having a shared future in shared societies in this very sustainable planet. So I think that it is very important that we go for our next Apollo. Our next Apollo is actually us living here in this planet and we have this big hairy goal which is SDGs in front of us. Now the question is how are we going to do it? It requires as we all said different type and new type of leadership. New type of leadership that is not uh, only goal oriented but is significantly significantly values based which is based on a certain set of values that lead us into something which we can call more fair, more just, more uh, let's say solidarity based society more than this one that we are having. We all know that we are not interested in going back to the old normal. We are not interested in reconstructing what we left a year ago, because anyway, we thought that what we had a year ago has to be radically changed. So now this is, I think, that's why we require, and I completely agree with all of you that we uh, it requires something which I can call, let's say, as you called the Gary, leadership for planetary momentum, but it requires not only science and technology, in Aristotle way of meaning. It, it does, doesn't require, Phoebe, it doesn't it require only epistem and techne. Forgive me if I, my, my pronunciation is not so well, but it is uh, requiring wisdom. It is requiring promises as well as while making something which we call a uh, response with resoluteness in thinking, in talking, and finally walking on a very long and winding road to SDGs for the beginning, our first moon station will be SDGs 2030 be completed as soon as possible. And that I see that as a leadership that requires three interconnected paths. First one is relief and resilience. That's what we have to do, right? 
to relieve ourselves and to resilient, be resilient. The second leader, element of leadership should be uh, targeted to restoring what should be restored, restructuring what should be restructured and resetting what has to be reset. And the third one, the most important one for the leadership point is what we, call, we can call reimagining, recreating or recovering. And that's what leadership will be about. So uh, my five final point is very simple. Apollo, just to give you a reminder, Apollo price tag was about 24, $25 billion of that 70s price tag. And that year, uh, big three of USA, uh, General Electric, uh, IBM, and uh, Shell were worth 18 billion. So you had the three big US companies who were worth two thirds of Apollo project. Today, three big, three big A's are Alphabet, Amazon, and Apple. And they are worth about seven to eight price tags of Apollo if you would convert it into today's dollars. So there is money. It's all possible. Technology will be higher. And I think what leadership requires is to use science and technology with more promises, right? And uh, I just want to thank to Vaira Freiberga and to, to Rosha Murado, who is not here with us, because we had excellent, excellent serious events. And that's what Vaira on the beginning was giving me tough time because I pressed her a lot to be that we do this because we had excellent events on this side. And last year we had excellent event that was talking about post pandemia period, talking about multilateralism, which was corresponding to a lot of things that we're talking here and about democracy, democracy challenges, especially putting human rights in the center. This was a, actually a very valuable exercise and I appreciate your generosity of spirit with me to indulge me in this dance because this is what life does. It lands a lot of, sends a lot of curveballs. And if we're not on our toes to not have a position to be a stakeholder, but to think on our feet and dance on our feet with life, uh, this is it. This is the moment, this is the performance. What I'm noticing here is genuine purpose-driven group. This is a group of well-intended people. Everybody's coming with their, their hearts, their intellectual capacities, their influence capacities, and everybody's saying, here's what I can offer. We all know it's not enough unless it's connected in the, in the larger front. In fact, we are saying, help me, help you, save me, save you, as human beings right here, right now, on behalf of humanity, right? The thing that we seem, and you correct me if I'm not stating this right, what we are agreeing on, that there is goodwill, that there is shared vulnerability, that there is money. Do we agree that there is no lack of money? There's money in the world, as Latko pointed out. There is universal need that much we know in shared vulnerability. There's, there's plenty of money, as Stefan said, okay, and, and others have mentioned, and Phoebe and everybody else. There is also a tremendous amount of knowledge. What are we lacking? And I would like to ask, in order to generate new planetary momentum, in order to nourish and foster this new leadership. This is the question from Amre Musa, as, as well as the entire panel. Uh, he's coming from the position of, amongst other roles he has played as the former uh, Secretary General of the Arab League. And that's an extremely valuable perspective to offer here. So I'm asking the panel to think in points who is the organization? Is there such an organization that can offer the convening and connecting space? Can World Academy do this? With whom, how? Um, as Phoebe pointed out, the uh, SDGs have already become the big largest um, framework that we can all connect to, it's not enough, right? So we are here needing a major cultural change because in the cultural domain, art and science are meeting, um, finances and economies and health and all of that is meeting as economies of life. What is the largest new narrative that we have to have for the cultural change? Who is there to create the space for the emergence of new leadership? What can World Academy do to either become that or to facilitate the birth of that leadership? So I'm going to start with Jonathan. I need specific things, and we're going to go in the same route, starting from Her Excellency Vaira, and in the same, uh, we're going to do a speed run. What can you do? What can be done? What WASP can do? Can WASP be that place? What can we do? We're just going to do a speed run. 
two, three points. Wasp, uh, WASP can uh, advance an integrated human security agenda that refocuses the duty of the state to take care of its population. And that, na that now, rather than take care of the state itself as an end, that means addressing the global threats that affect every human being on the planet that require global identity, global community, and global cooperation institutionally and culturally. Those threats that cannot be denied are the climate, the health of the oceans, the water table, the topsoil, the rainforests, pandemic diseases, and the elimination of weapons of mass, massive destruction, we'll call them. That's, that's one. Number two, at a domestic level, politicians are elected almost entirely on much more provincial concerns that are largely, at least in the United States, driven by a pay to play dynamic. And that's very important. And you have to take pay to play out of the electoral process. So we need campaign finance reform. Uh, and I, I don't want to drill into that, but in, if, you, if you ever live in a place where pay to play is in play, you know exactly what I mean. And last but not least, our cultural institutions uh, have to promote a cosmopolitan critical, uh, uh, critical approach uh, to problems. And that goes to fundamental freedoms, human rights, and, and, and because we have a, a, a bizarre toxic assault on freedom of speech from what would appear to be progressives, it, it, which is so bizarre. So the three principles for cultural leadership, I think are one, the, uh, the rule of law based on the pursuit of justice, two, the utilization of science um, as, a, uh, as an assertion of a way of living in harmony with the natural world, and three, because if we're gonna talk about human security, we have to talk about meaning because human beings are creatures that, that need meaning. People never go to war over survival. They always go to war over identity and love. So, so the importance of fundamental values and freedoms such as those embodied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the religious traditions of the world, the ethical foundations of them is very important because much of the liberal understanding we have of the importance of the individual actually comes from a philosophy that acknowledges the transcendent and the purely secular uh, is problematic in that regard. So we really have to accept that there is a teleology, a purpose to human existence that may be not reducible to science, but certainly cannot be ignored. And I would come back to the very perennial values that all of the religions assert, uh, often, often paying the price of hypocrisy, but loving kindness and compassion. I want to thank the panel for a terrific discussion. And uh, we thought we had actually moved the time to give more time, but not nearly enough for such a eloquent uh, uh, group of people. So thank you so much. It's been very thought provoking, uh, provocative, uh, and we have a lot to think about as a result. Thank you.